A room temperature superconductor would completely change electronics. And now we finally understand what makes a high temperature superconductor work at these elevated temperatures. To understand this, scientists had to build a special microscope that could directly visualize the electrons in a superconductor. Using this microscope, scientists have found that high temperature superconductors are the result of something called super exchange. So what does this mean for the future of superconductors? Will we have a room temperature superconductor by the end of the year? And what is so super about this super exchange? Let's discuss it. Superconductivity is a state of matter where electrons band together in such a way that the electrical resistance drops to zero. Being able to conduct electricity without resistance is so appealing. Computer processors are significantly limited by the heating from the current running through them. If we were able to remove resistance from these processes, we could immediately get a dramatic improvement in computing. And this is only one of the many amazing advances that we would be able to access if only we had superconductors that worked at room temperature. But there is a major problem. We don't know why high temperature superconductors work. Well, that is until now. But before we get into that, what did we know before this? The story of our growing understanding of superconductivity is a long and eventful one, but it has been extremely impactful. So get ready for the Nobel Prizes because there has been a lot. Superconductivity was discovered on April 8th, 1911 by Heinrich Ohns, who was studying the resistance of solid mercury at cryogenic temperatures. And he is the first on the list to receive Nobel Prize in 1913 for his work at producing low temperature experiments. But finding superconductors is difficult and we had no idea what makes a superconductor in the first place. It took decades of research to find only a few more superconductors with a similar low temperature transition of about 20 Kelvin. Then in 1933, Meisner managed to figure out that superconductors don't just have zero resistance, but also repel magnetic fields, which was an important step towards understanding what was making this exotic state of matter. Shortly after this, in 1937, Landau proposed a theory for phase transitions that could help to explain the transition from a metal to a superconductor, which earned him the 1962 Nobel Prize. But this still didn't explain why superconductors were superconductors. We would have to wait until 1957 to have a concrete idea behind the mechanism, when three scientists, Barden, Cooper and Schiffer, would develop the theory that would come to be known as BCS theory, which would earn them the Nobel Prize in 1972. They theorized that at cold temperatures in certain materials, electrons with opposite spin and momenta could become coupled together such that they would attract one another rather than repel, and would form a new quasi-particle called a Cooper pair, which would have zero resistance. Now this is counterintuitive. Why would two charged particles all of a sudden attract each other rather than repel? Well, there has to be another force that causes them to attract each other. And this comes in the form of their mutual interaction with lattice vibrations called phonons. When there are very few phonons, that is, when the material is cold, the phonons can interact with the electrons in a way that generates an effective potential that attracts the electrons together. And that this interaction is what forms Cooper pairs and thus superconductivity. It is also why superconductivity only forms at low temperatures. As the temperature rises, there are more and more phonons in the lattice which will eventually start to give the electrons a large enough momentum kick to break the Cooper pair. This fundamentally means you can't have a superconductor at high temperatures. Well, at least you can't have a conventional superconductor. After a couple of other Nobel Prizes in superconductors, we finally have a measurement that would fundamentally change our understanding of how superconductors work. In 1987, the highest temperature superconductor was niobium germanium with a temperature of 23 Kelvin. But then a new class of materials containing copper oxides was discovered to have a drastically higher superconducting temperature. 
In 1986, Baldors and Müller discovered that lanthium barium copper oxide had a critical temperature of 35 degrees Kelvin, which ultimately won them the Nobel Prize. Shortly after this, a similar compound of yttrium barium copper oxide, or YBCO for short, was found to have a critical temperature of 92 Kelvin. This completely changed the traditional thought on how superconductors work. These materials, referred to as cuprates, can't form superconductivity through phonon interactions. They're simply too hot for that to be possible. So there must be another way for the cooper pairs to form. Now, before we discuss how these unconventional superconductors work, we should discuss the role of pressure in recent superconductor experiments. When you take a material and place it under a large pressure, the atoms will compress together, which can result in the atomic lattice rearranging and modifying the superconductivity. But it also changes the characteristics of the phonons in the material. And for superconductors, this is in a favorable direction. Many conventional superconductors show a higher critical temperature at higher pressures. Ultimately, this has resulted in near room temperature superconductors, but at extremely high pressures. There was a claim of a room temperature superconductor, but this paper was recently retracted after some questions were raised about the data analysis. Either way, while high temperature superconductivity can be made at these high pressures, for technological applications, I think we can all understand that this method is not viable. Maybe it might be useful for some deep underwater cables, but for everyday electronics, not so much. So we need to understand how unconventional superconductors work so we can hopefully design an ambient conditions superconductor. So this takes us to the latest results. The proposed mechanism for the attractive force between electrons is something called super exchange. Now, when we say that there is an exchange interaction, we are referring to the interaction of two electrons that are bound to an atom that are neighbors. Specifically, the atoms are the closest atoms to each other. Now, super exchange is the same, but it's between next ne nearest neighbors, meaning that there is an atom in between the two atoms that are interacting, which plays a role in the interaction. This makes it super because it's an interaction that occurs over a large distance. The theory that super exchange could act as an attractive force to form Cooper pairs isn't new. It was first proposed in 1987 by Nobel laureate Philip Anderson, but we had no way to confirm this. In this recent research, scientists developed a new special version of a scanning electron microscope referred to as an SEM to image electrons and their interaction directly. They used this SEM to measure the energy required for electrons to hop from one atom to another. They then used this special version that had a superconductor on the end of the scanning tip to map the density of Cooper pairs. Now, importantly, if super exchange is the mechanism behind the formation of Cooper pairs, these two maps will be the inverse of each other. That is, when the electrons require more energy to hop to another atom, there will be a low number of Cooper pairs. And when the hopping energy is low, there'll be a larger density of Cooper pairs. And this is exactly what they saw. So now that we are relatively confident that super exchange is responsible for high temperature superconductivity in unconventional superconductors, what does this mean for the future of material fabrication? Well, it means we can start to focus our searches for materials that will maximize super exchange. This doesn't need to take the traditional approach of us trying to grow new materials and hope that they have the right qualities. Recent research in analog quantum computing has shown the power of this technique for simulating electron interactions in manually constructed materials. This could be a viable method to first test certain structures before making them directly. Another option is to potentially use two-dimensional materials. Recent work in two-dimensional materials and different methods of stacking two-dimensional materials on top of each other has opened unprecedented control and tunability of electron interactions. 
While we don't have a room temperature superconductor, with this new understanding, we are one step closer. If you are interested in some of these pathways, check out this video where I discuss recent breakthroughs in analog quantum computing. Thanks for watching, have fun, and see you next time.